So today we're going to go over um, manure management and specifically more in depth on composting of your horse manure. So a couple things about my background. So actually my master's and my PhD research were on composting. Um, specifically, I did research on composting carcasses or horse carcasses, which is kind of sad <laughs> um, and it was not what I went to graduate school for, but it's what I ended up doing for my project. But I have a good knowledge of the composting process through this and a good understanding of how it works. And it's a great resource for looking at how to manage our manure, especially on some of your smaller farms. It does require some work and some things in order to make it um, usable, but it's definitely a good resource. So a little bit about composting um, is we all know that having horses, you're going to have a lot of manure. As much as we would like to say we don't, it's probably one of the biggest issues and obligations and things we need to think about with having any type of horse farm horse facility and especially if you're going to have horses that are stalled um, you're going to have a lot of manure you have to deal with um, but we want to make sure that we have good sound environmental practices and that we're managing our manure properly so that our neighbors um, the city the counties um, aren't getting calls that we have piles of manure that smell or that are blocking people's views or unsightly and those kind of things. And so composting is one option um, that can promote green farm practices and allow us to turn that manure into a really good usable uh, resource. So some things about why you should compost. Um, it's going to reduce your manure piles volume by up to 50%. So you can go from a huge pile to a lot more manageable amount of material um, that then can be used as a soil fertilizer and amendment. Also, it's going to reduce the moisture content. And then if your composting is done properly, it should reach temperatures between 130 or 170 degrees Fahrenheit. And at those temperatures, you're going to kill fly larvae, parasites, uh, fecal coliform bacteria, and a lot of other pathogens um, that aren't going to be able to survive in those high temperatures. Um, also, many weed seeds are destroyed at these temperatures as well. And so, like our foxtail that's pretty potential or potent sometimes in some areas of Nebraska, and that we really want to get rid of, this may be a way to reduce some of that as well because we're going to kill those seeds during that composting process. Um, and then additionally, like I already said, it's going to be an ideal additive to your horse pastures. So spreading that compo compost material, finished compost back out on your pasture can be um, beneficial to the soil. But you can also use it for landscaping, nursery, gardens, um, and in some cases, in some places, um, if you have a large enough facility and you want to market it, you can potentially um, provide that compost to others in your neighborhood, help with communities. You could also use it um, for profit. Sometimes some places um, people have been known to sell their compost, especially if you have a good quality compost and you're doing it properly, um, it's a good end product in the end. So what is composting? So the basic premise of it, it's a biological decomposition of organic matter under controlled aerobic conditions. So it's the breakdown of the manure, the wood shavings or straw or hay, materials that are going to be found in your um, manure, and then breaking it down using oxygen, which is what's mean is meant by aerobic conditions. So using oxygen, uh, bacteria and fungi that are found in those materials are going to break it down into a more usable resource. 
And so then after that compost is cured, it's a good soil conditioner. It can improve water drainage, airflow, and soil nutrients. So I'm going to go through um, several composting methods. Um, not all will work on every farm. Some require specific equipment, some don't. Um, some are going to cost more to set up. And then depending on how much manure you have can dictate um, which method. Because if you have a lot um, that you're producing, if you have a large horse facility, you may not want to use certain methods because you're going to not have the space to do so. And then some methods for composting require a lot more management than others. And so having a good understanding of those different options can be helpful. And so I'm going to go through these from the least to the most technical. So th this first one is um, transfer bins. And so with this method, you usually are going to have several different areas um, that you will start the compost in. Um, and then as you move it, as, as it progresses, you move it from one area to the next and you mix in other compost. And as it, you move it around in the different bins, it's going to get aerated when you move it. But then also by time you reach the last bin, it should be um, hopefully reached a consistent stage where it's a usable resource. Um, and I'll go into more detail of how to set this up here in a later slide. Um, the next one is turned windrows. Um, and this one, you don't necessarily need a building or facility. So in some cases, it can be easier because um, you're going to just need an, a large flat area that has um, good drainage, not near waterways and things like that, where you're going to pile it up and then um, you want to mechanically turn it over time. But then there's some different aeration things to think about with doing a turned windrow. Another would be in-vessel composting. Um, so your manure is going to be placed in a large container, and then you want to be able to dump it, turn it, or and aerate it pretty regularly. Um, this picture is not ideal because these are tiny, small um, in vessel composting, but it's similar to this as you would have a large, um, and depending on how many horses you have in vessel composting, um, could be quite costly to uh, fill large containers um, with material. So going through, we're going to go into the next, like, how do you in general compost and then those specific different composting um, types. Um, and it doesn't have to be a complicated process. It's actually pretty simple once you have kind of the general um, idea of how it works down. But it does require management and some thought. Um, if you just take your manure and pile it up out behind your barn, that's not composting. That's just stockpiling your manure. And it's not likely to have an end result of really nice, usable um, fertilizer that has killed pathogens and things like that. Instead, you're going to have material that still has all those pathogens remaining in the end, end material. Um, so ideally, we want to create this environment that those microorganisms can digest the organic material. So a little bit on the chemistry of composting. It's the four main things you have to really consider, and I will give you some easy things to think about um, when we're developing a compost. Um, so the first one is you want to have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 25 to 1 to 40 to 1. Um, and one thing that when I was learning a whole lot more about this, your carbon materials are usually going to be your like tan colored yellow type material. So your wood shavings, um, your 
if there's dead grass, um, straw, things like that are going to be good carbon sources. And then your nitrogen is going to be your actual like manure is going to make up the nitrogen or if you have um, fresh grass or clippings, things like that that are nice and green are going to be your nitrogen. And so you want to make sure that you have 25% more of your shavings carbon material than you do your nitrogen and somewhere in there. Um, however, Shavings are really high in carbon, so to nitrogen, there's like very little to no nitrogen. And so um, depending on how much urine you're taking out too, um, you could end up with having too much carbon and not enough nitrogen. So looking at that, and you may want to hold back some of your shavings when you, in your saw cleanings, or provide more nitrogen for the microorganisms through um, urea or things like that potentially if you have a lot of shavings and bedding material and not a lot of manure. Um, the next that you want to look at would be your moisture content and you want a, between a 40 and 60 percent moisture content. And a 40 to 60 percent moisture content is the best way to tell if you have that level without like taking and sending it off for a moisture analysis. If you just take and you grab a handful of it, feel free to wear gloves, but if you grab a handful of it and you squeeze it, if the material clumps together and it's not necessarily saturated where it's a dripping water, but it clumps together and holds together and you can feel it feels wet and damp then it's probably in that 40 to 60% range. If when you squeeze it together, it just falls apart, um, it's really loose, then it's probably too dry and you need to add water. And that's the other big thing with just stockpiling your manure out in a big stockpile is you're never gonna reach a high enough moisture content. And a lot of times people will say, well, it's gonna rain and things like that. I live in a rainy area. But what happens with the composting and those piles is they kind of develop a crust on the outside where it gets kind of sealed or depending on the shape of your pile, the water just runs off. And so it doesn't actually soak down inside the material and that could lead to not having enough moisture. So with composting, it is really important that when you start your composting, that you add water and then throughout the process when you turn your material that you check that moisture content and a lot of times you have to add water at that time. Um, the next is your porosity is 35 to 40 percent and that means like your air spaces between the material and so depending on the type of shavings you use you may need to add a way of aerating your pile or adding oxygen to it if the porosity is really low. However, if you use like a really big, thick, um, flaked shavings or even just a pretty nice flaked shavings, usually you're going to have a pretty good porosity because those materials don't stick together. But I do know um, sometimes the bulk shavings that we buy um, from different places are a lot finer and that material is going to lead to having less porosity, so it doesn't have less spaces between those materials, and you potentially are going to lead to clumping and not enough oxygen. And so in those cases, you may need to turn your material more often to add more oxygen, or you may need to provide um, aeration, and I'll go into how you can do that. And then your temperature, as I said before, between um, 140-170 um, degrees Fahrenheit and you want it to get up and stay at that temperature for at least three weeks um, to show that it has it needs three weeks to kill off all those pathogens so um, anywhere from two to three weeks so 14 um, to 21 days. <coughs> so here's just a little more information on the carbon to nitrogen. If you don't have enough nitrogen it's going to slow the composting process. However, if you have too much nitrogen, it can increase odors uh, because of the buildup of ammonia gas. Um, but as most horse owners, use of wood shavings is usually, usually going to minimize that nitrogen and you're going to end up 
actually with the opposite. Another thing to do is as if you are mixed, like so you bring, you start a new pile, if you will mix in some of the already cured um, active compost in with the raw material, it can help balance the ratio. And so if you have excess carbon, you may want to add some urea fertilizer um, to help with increasing that um, nitrogen ratio. And then a lot of times with our composting, especially if you have a small horse farm, you have like one stall, maybe two, you may want to add um, your other animals, byproducts of dogs or cat feces or other household weights. Um, and those actually are not ideal to add to your horse manure compost, um, just because they're gonna change that carbon to nitrogen ratio. And then like leaves and grass clippings um, can be added to the pile, but I would do that on a limited basis. Like you don't wanna add them every single time you clip your grass, because you're gonna end up um, offsetting that nice balance. Um, so nitrogen is the food for the microbes. So here you can see carbon nitrogen ratios of the different materials. So like our straw, our soft and hardwood shavings are really high in carbon. And so, um, but your grass clippings, leaves and horse manure are gonna be a little bit higher in nitrogen. And so those are what's gonna help with that process. Um, so moisture, 40 to 60%, so around 50% moisture. Um, so as I said before, take a handful of the compost, squeeze it. Um, it feels like a run out sponge. You're great. If it's too wet, you may need to add more of your shavings, manure material. Um, or if it's too dry, you want to definitely add more water. Um, one thing that I have noticed that, or that's helpful is to add the water kind of slowly and you know, and mix your material as you're adding it. And so then you can really get a nice uniform wetness. And also you can make sure that you don't over wet it because if you over wet it, then you potentially are going to uh, lose some of that porosity when it's too wet. Another thing is, um, you know, having some way to cover the pile um, can also be helpful with um, keeping the moisture content at what you want and ha not having to aerate um, <coughs> as often. However, you don't want the cover that you put on to be directly touching or contact with the compost because then you can lead to uh, not having enough oxygen for the microbes. And feel free if you have a question at any time to um, put a message in the chat or um, voice them. Um, so aeration. Ideally, we want our composting process to be aerobic. So we want the microorganisms that require oxygen to do the breaking down of the material. Um, if you don't have enough aeration or your material is too wet, you can lead to composting anaerobically, which is not ideal because it's going to produce a lot more um, gases that we don't want. And it's also going to be a, quite a bit stinkier and smellier um, if it's composting anaerobically, so without enough oxygen. So making sure you have enough oxygen is really important because that's what's going to help um, kill those pathogens, seeds that you don't want. Um, it's also going to help get it up to high enough temperatures that you want and those kinds of things. Um, so the composting pro process produces heat um, and then and we need to make sure we aerate it so that we provide the microbes with oxygen and remove excess heat. And so so there's different ways of aerating. So there's ways where we are going to do active aeration or passive aeration, and I'll go into detail what those are later. Or another option is just turning your material, um, your compost material regularly, um, and that also will help with 
that aeration process. Um, and so the ideal temperature range of compost 130 to 160. Um, and I already said that. So some things to consider when um, deciding to compost is determining where you want to do this. Ideally, you want it to be accessible from wherever the manure is going to be. So um, if you have your horses in stalls or you have your horses in runs or small paddocks and you're going to be moving the manure, ideally you would want your compost pile to be relatively close or in a short enough distance that you can easily move it without um, hauling material a long ways. Also, you don't want horses to have contact with the pile, so we don't want to put it um, on the size. I'm going to go into some more detail on the size of that when I get to the different types. So I'll talk about um, how to set up um, uh, the different uh, bins versus uh, a row and those kinds of things, and I'll talk about some size. Um, And then depending on the method, so in some methods, we're gonna need, well, in all methods, really, we need water. So ideally, any of them, you need to have them near a water source or where you can hook a water hose up and get it over to it. Um, if you're gonna do some active aeration where you pump air into your pile, then you would wanna be near electricity. But I would say that's, probably going to be a lot more work on your end. So if that's not really what you're looking for, you wouldn't necessarily need that. And then you want them on level ground and away from any type of water runoff from barns or hillsides. And then if you do have some runoff areas, ideally you would want to have a grassy area next to it so that any water that runs off, it runs off into that grass. Um, and so, instead of having any pathogens or anything leaching into your soil, it's going to run off into the grass, the grassy areas. So space requirements, um, the amount of space will vary and it really depends on the composting method and then how much time you want to spend managing the pile. So if you don't want to spend a whole lot of time, there are some smaller ways to do this that require less space. Um, and things. And then the composition and quantity of the raw material. If you're mainly doing, you know, one or two stalls and your horses are outside the majority of the time and they're only in occasionally, you're going to have a lot less material to work with. You're going to need a lot less space. Another thing to consider is you want is environmental factors. And ideally, it's best to start your composting in the summer months. So like if it's the first time you've ever composted, I would say you should start it now, this time of year. Um, it's perfect because your temperatures are warm enough. You can start in the winter, but ideally if you're gonna start in the winter, you should have an already established compost and then you can mix in some of that already established compost material with your new and that's gonna help kickstart it a little faster. Whereas if you start in the winter months, um, it, you can get it to work. It just takes a lot more work. It's going to be a lot slower starting because um, it, it takes those, those bacteria and microbes really like a certain high temperature. And if it's too cold, it's hard for them to get going and get started. So here are some calculations you can do to help estimate your composting volume and determine which methods to use. So in this example, if we have two horses, their house installs, um, horses produce about 0.8 cubic feet of manure and urine per day, so about 50 pounds. Um, and so one to five cubic feet of wood shavings would be removed from the stalls daily. Um, so the 0.8 cubic feet of manure and urine plus the two cubic feet of bedding per horse times two horses, times 265 days, it's going to equal about 1,168 cubic feet or 43.26 cubic yards per year. However, if you're turning your, that's if they're in a stall 24-7 all day, 
But if you're turning your horses out, you can reduce that quite a bit. Um, but knowing that, you can kind of estimate how much space you're gonna need for how many horses you have and what type of living situation. So some equipment you're gonna need, um, regardless of your composting methods, is ideally you need a long probe thermometer um, because to do proper composting, you really do have to check the temperatures. Because if you're not monitoring the temperature, then pretend your compost may get too cold or it's gonna get too hot. And either one of those is not gonna be ideal for the microorganisms. And so you wanna help maintain that proper temperature. And we'll go through um, at certain times of when you want to turn things dependent on those temperatures. Um, also, you can purchase online. It's pretty easy if you just Google a compost maturity test kit. Um, it'll help determine if the compost material is finished. However, you don't necessarily have to have that, but it can be useful. So the first method I'm gonna go more detail into is the turned windrow. And, um, I would say this is probably the easiest method if you don't want to build anything because um, it doesn't require but just space basically um, and in all honesty this is what I do at home with my personal horses um, is the turned windrow and so what this involves is you're gonna pile your raw material in long arched rows and so um, you, it may take a little while for you to build up and enough material to start your composting. And so you don't necessarily start it on day one, the first day you take your wheelbarrow out. But after time, once you've built up a nice um, windrow, and so ideally a windrow should be between five to eight feet high and from eight to 10 feet wide. And then it can be as long as it needs to be for how much material. And so like for myself, you know, it took um, several weeks with, the two horses I have to build up to that amount. And so, um, and ideally with this, you wanna make sure you um, have it on a well-drained base um, with no more than one to 2% slope. So on a pretty flat area, um, the base of this can be soil, it can be gravel, it can be crushed limestone. Um, it's kind of dependent on what you have in your area. Um, so the, the biggest thing is the reason we want to wait till you have at least that five foot high amount, eight to 10 foot wide, is that if you have smaller, you're going to lose heat more quickly. And then that slows down your pro the composting process. And so making sure you have a nice high pile that's nice and wide um, is going to help with maintaining heat. Also, you want to make sure it's a nice rounded top, so slope on it so that there's no flat spots, as those flat spots are going to hold water. Um, and you want that water to run off because um, you don't want, if once you've already wet the material and you've got it to the right, correct moisture content, you don't want it to get excessively wet, because that can lead to anaerobic conditions. So some ways you can do this um, is by unloading a manure spreader at the end of the row as needed and simply driving forward, or, which is what I do, I push my wheelbarrow out there <laughs> and build my pile, and then I do have a tractor with a front end loader, and so as it grows, and then when I have enough material, I then add my water to it, grab handful of it, make sure it's the correct moisture content. So when I squeeze it, it feels like a sponge, it holds that water, but it's not dripping. Um, and then I form it back into my nice windrow. Um, and then I leave it and I usually put and go out and check the, thermo the temperature regularly. Um, so it is ideal to cover the rows if you can. 
I personally just don't have the materials to do it, so I don't. Um, but if you can, it is a good idea. Um, so, so to, and one thing to do to cover it if you don't have like a roof or those kinds of things is to use um, finished compost if you have it. If it's the first row you're starting, you may not have finished material. Um, So I'm gonna get into how to regulate the temperature here in a little bit, but the easiest answer is by turning the material. So um, once you get the material wet and you build your rows, it should, the temperature should start to rise and it should, you want it to um, get up to that 140, you know, in that 170 temperature range and it should stay up there for two to four weeks or two to three weeks. Um, if you're having dips in your temperature, then you probably need to aerate. And how you would aerate would be to take your front end loader and mix your material would be one way. Um, I'll go through and show you some, some ways when you're setting up your compost pile that you can passively aerate or actively aerate as you're going through. And then you wouldn't need to turn it. And in those cases, hopefully your piles would maintain temperatures. Um, if your piles aren't getting hot enough, um, which sometimes happens, especially if you start in the winter months, they may take a while. Um, then you want to make sure you check your moisture content, that you're not too high in moisture um, or you're too low in moisture. So if you squeeze it and it seems really wet, you may need to just add some more dry material to help get the temperature back up. But if it's the other way where it's too dry, you may want to add more water and mix. So as it's being formed, it will start to heat up. Um, and you want to uh, monitor it as the temperatures approach that 160 degrees. Um, usually for seven to 10 days, it should get up to above 140 for um, the two to three weeks. But then it, at one point, it will probably get pretty close to 160 um, for about seven to 10 days. Um, it'll usually take between 8 to 12 weeks to complete, so it's not necessarily a quick process, but you, and you do need to check it. Um, so the more the row is turned, the more quickly it will compost, and that's usually because the more oxygen you add to that pile, and so every time you turn it, um, and one thing when you're turning it, especially if you're using a front end loader, is you want to make sure you're not packing it. So like as you scoop up the material, you kind of turn it over, and you dump it, and then you kind of slowly keep mixing it and not try and push down on it and drive over it because the packing is going to reduce that um, air um, porosity as well. Um, if the compost is not close to maturity and the temperature drops below 130 degrees, um, you want to stop turning to allow the pile to heat up again. Um, so you give it a little bit of time, it should hopefully get back up if it has the correct moisture content. So the next method, if you have the ability, is transfer bins. And this can reduce some of the time for your composting if you use the transfer bins um, from the windrow. Um, so in this, you have, um, a lot of times people will build a building that has, it's not necessarily enclosed, like a roof, a roof, that word comes up funny. And then you have some type of base, and then you have bins that you're gonna do your composting in. And ideally though, you want these um, to be made out of some type of material that's not necessarily, um, like you can use cement or asphalt, um, However, then you don't have very good drainage with those. You sometimes end up with water pooling, especially if it rains, if you don't have good drainage. But a lot of times people use um, cement blocks that will have like a crack between them so that the water can drain, railroad ties, landscape timbers. Um, I've even seen some made out of, um, I just went blank on the word I was gonna use. Um, I'll think of it in a second. <laughs> um, 
but you want some type of base that hopefully water can drain off, um, but at the same time, you could scrape off of a turn. And so ideally with this process, you want four to eight bins um, for completing the process. The bins are typically open fronted, um, eight feet by eight feet, and then three to six feet high. So this is kind of a general good estimate of a size. And also that eight feet by eight feet, a lot of times you're, you can get in there with a tractor and a front end loader to, um, to move the material and those kinds of things. Um, so if you're gonna do this by hand, it's gonna be a lot of work. Um, and then three to six feet high, so it has like three sides um, that are between three and six feet high, so you can keep your material in there and keep it in that nice bin space. Um, if you only have a couple horses, you can have smaller bins. Um, it just kind of depends too um, on the what kind of equipment you want to use. So if you're going to use a tractor, you want to make sure you make it wide enough you can fit your tractor in there. If you're going to do it by hand, you could have a lot smaller bins. Um, but the biggest thing is you do want to still make it at least three feet in height. Um, so leaving some small gaps in the wall material will allow airflow into the pile. So like on the back walls, if you use wood and it's slatted, what I was, um, the word I was trying to come up with before, um, pallets. Oh my gosh, I don't know why that could have come to me. I've seen them a lot of times made out of pallets where the walls are pallets because then they have the um, holes. The only problem is, is sometimes with the pallets, it gets inside the pallet and so you end up with material that you can't ever take out. So I don't know that that's necessarily the best option, but it's um, something you could use. Um, and then you definitely want your bins to be covered. So a roof, ideally, it, but if that's too expensive, which it is a lot of times, some type of tarp that you can hook at the tops of those walls that are on the side. Um, you just wanna make sure the tarp doesn't touch the compost um, or sag and collect water, that it's like a nice tight tarp over the top with some space between the tarp and your compost material. And the same, and so then here are some steps on how to go about using your um, transfer bin. So you're gonna take your raw material and add it to your first bin, um, check your temperature and moisture. So make sure your raw material, you wet it, get it to the correct moisture content, and then you add it to your first bin. Um, when the bin gets full or the temperature gets close to the 160 degrees, um, then you would want to transfer that material to the next bin. And one thing you're doing is when you move the material, you're gonna, uh, it's gonna be aerated when you're transferring it and turning it. So um, you don't necessarily have to sit there and turn the material, you just take it from one to the next bin and that's gonna add the aeration. And then you add raw material back uh, to the first bin. And so one nice thing about the transfer bin is if you have like a smaller facility, you can use this as a way to, you have, instead of having to wait till you have a large amount of material to do your windrow, with this, you can just keep filling up your um, first bin until it's full and then hopefully it, within a week or so, it should come up to temperature and then you can move it to the next bin. Um, and then start filling it again. And so you can kind of keep moving through this um, as you go. Um, and so you want to monitor all bins regularly, transfer them as needed. So as they get full and the temperatures start to um, get up to that temperature and they maintain it, then you want to move them to the next one. Um, and then as the volume of material begins to decrease, um, you can start to mix bins together. So as you remember from earlier, as you compost, you're gonna reduce your material from, for about 50%. And so um, by the time you get to the end, you have a lot less material. So that's why as you go, you can combine um, some of it. And so the length of time required, it's gonna depend on how rapidly the bins are filled. Uh, 
And then if you want to keep the process going quicker, adding active compost to the first bin will speed up that first bin getting up to temperature. And then when you are moving and transferring bins, if you need more water, that would be the time when you want to do it um, is when you're transferring it. So some things you can do to help with that aeration, because aeration is really important for um, keeping your piles going. And so the first one is um, active aeration. So in this method, air is gonna be forced through a vented pipe with a fan or a leaf blower. And so a lot of times this is gonna be done um, on like your windrow, you would have like a pipe similar to like these that has holes in it that you would run down the center of your um, windrow or even your transfer bins you could do it. It's just a lot harder in a transfer bin setting. Here's more of in a, I meant in your windrow setting. Um, but you would then want to pump air using like a leaf blower or a fan through, especially if you're not going to be able to turn your piles um, as often, so if you don't have access to be able to turn them um, regularly, using some type of active aeration can be helpful because you're going to pump air through your pile um, and keep the oxygen levels up. Another option, uh, to do one thing before I go on with the actively aerated is the pipe should stop about five to eight feet from one end of the row and stick out from the other end. Um, and this can help. Then the next method would be passive aeration and that's what the picture you see right there is you would have pipes that have holes in them um, to allow natural air to go in them. So you can use a four inch drain pipe with two or three rows of half inch holes drilled every 12 inches. Um, and then with the passive aeration, the airflow through the pipes is forced out through the holes by wind currents um, aerating the row. Um, and so this, ideally the row would be created on a six inch deep mat of finished compost, straw or peat moss as the row is formed. And then the pipe is added perpendicular every 12 to 18 inches near the base of the row. And so um, in this picture, they have them standing up, but if you did like a long windrow um, with the activation, you would just want one long pipe that goes down the center that you pump air through. But using passive aeration is you would want multiple pipes about every um, going perpendicular to the direction of your windrow that would have holes in them um, and you'd have them about 12 to 18 inches apart all the way down the whole length. And then that is also going to allow air in. And then one thing, even with the passive aeration, is you could always um, put like a leaf blower or something in it if your piles are needing more oxygen. Um, to increase that air at that time. Um, so if your piles are getting too hot, that could be an indication that um, they're not getting enough oxygen. So if they're, and so if that's the case, like if you check your temperatures and they're getting well above that 160, to 170, you may want to turn your piles, or if you have some type of active aeration set up in your system, then you could add air in that process. So hopefully once you've composted, then you need to know like, when is it done? Like, when is it good and I can use it? Um, and so there's three main indicator is the pile, the pile volume has been reduced by about 50% or more. Um, all the material is half inch or smaller. And then probably the easiest thing to note is the temperature has dropped to near ambient temperatures. 
Um, so if the material doesn't heat after mixing and you um, can't recognize the original ingredients, then you've probably reached that finished compost. Um, one thing about finished compost too, if it's good quality compost, it's gonna be a nice dark, almost black in color, um, dark brown. It usually smells earthy and not, it does not smell anymore like manure. It's gonna have a nice earth, earthy smell. Um, if it still has a stinky smell, it probably needs to compost longer because um, that is one good indication. And this, so these things would assume that you have the correct nitrogen and moisture content during the composting process. If you are unable to maintain proper temperatures, but your material hasn't, you can still see manure in it and still see specific shavings, um, then you, I wouldn't say that it's done. You probably need to either mix new material with it, either need to add some nitrogen, or you may need to add more water and those kinds of things. Um, and start the process and go longer rather than um, stopping. Um, and then another option is to purchase a composting maturity kit and check the material that way. Um, and then even when your compost material is done, ideally um, it should not be used for a potting amendment or around sensitive plants until it's been cured for about six months to a year. However, Recently matured compost is perfectly acceptable on pastures, crop fields, lawns, gardens, and most landscaping. It's just if you have any sensitive type plants, um, then you wouldn't want to. Um, but if you're spreading it back out on your pasture, it's great for that. It's going to help with soil fertility um, in those cases. So in summary, um, manure management is not simply concerned for livestock operations or large horse farms, but even small horse farms could do a composting and manage their manure in this way. Um, and then composting is great for taking that material and turning it into a really good usable uh, resource. And it's definitely much better than just taking your um, horse shavings, manure, and spreading them back out on your pasture. Because when you do that, um, you know, if your horses have any worms, parasites, things like that, then they're just, you're just spreading those eggs back out on your pasture. Or, you know, if you have your horse, if, when the hay that you fed your horse, if it had, you know, foxtail seeds or weed seeds that you don't really want, and you're taking and spreading that manure back on your pasture, you're just spreading those seeds back out. Whereas if you compost, you're potentially going to um, kill those pathogens and reduce those weed seeds and those kinds of things that you wouldn't want. Well, I think that's all I have for composting. Do you have any additional questions?